You're watching BBC World News. These are our top stories. New figures have been released. They show China's economy grew at 6.9% last year. It's the slowest rate for the country's economy in a quarter of a century. The BBC has heard from eyewitnesses alleging human rights abuses by the Nigerian army during a military crackdown last month. More money has been promised for English language lessons in the UK to promote the integration of Muslim women. The government denies that it's stereotyping communities. And the film director Spike Lee is going to boycott this year's Oscars. It's because of the exclusively white list of uh, nominees in the acting categories. Let's begin the day's news review with the Wall Street Journal, looking at the Chinese figures, which have been released uh, by its National Bureau of Statistics. Uh, the journal, actually, the article, of course, it was published before that 6.9% figure of growth in 2015 uh, was released. Uh, but it says, as you can see here, it augurs more weakness. Now, let's move on to the front page of the Financial Times, uh, looking at the other big story of the week, uh, the fact that OPEC is firing a warning shot as Iran surges back onto the world's oil markets. This comes as sanctions against Iran uh, were lifted over the weekend. More bad news for the British steel industry. Tata Steel has confirmed it's cutting over 1,000 jobs. The Daily Telegraph says a further 1,700 jobs could go as the company restructures. The Guardian's financial pages look at some of the key issues to be discussed at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland this year. They say you can expect to hear about migration, market turmoil and cybercrime. David Cameron wants uh, Muslim women, as we've been reporting, to be able to speak the English language properly or risk deportation from the UK. This is in Gulf News. And a new form of IVF which could replace so-called test tube babies has been launched in the UK. It involves placing sperm and egg cells in a tiny capsule which is then inserted into the mother's womb. I'm Rita Sanders here this morning, oil analyst to Energy Aspects. Over to you, Sally. Morning, I'm Rita. Morning. Um, so, yes, China, we now have the number, but what many always say uh, outside of China is, well, to what extent can we rely on this data anyway. And so this article brings that out in the Wall Street Journal. It says many economists question the reliability of the official data, say the actual growth, growth is perhaps between 4 and 6% as opposed to 6.9. That's probably fair. I mean, if you look at the industrial production numbers, they tend to be probably more aligned to the economy and they are slowing. But I think the one thing I'd say within all of this is that, yes, manufacturing has slowed significantly, but the service sector now is much, much bigger. It is the majority of the Chinese economy, I think 52 or 53 percent. We tend to not report on it because it's not as fun and, and all of that. But I think that there is rebalancing going on. And honestly, some other economies of the world would kill to get 6.9 percent of growth. They would. And, and as you say, the rebalancing seems to be happening. Yes. And that is no quick fix. It is a long, long process. And I remember the, the figures for services in December saw quite, saw quite a spike yes. in growth in the service sector. So as you say, we tend to focus on the bad and not really highlight where the shift is taking place. I mean, it's such a big country. Any rebalancing is going to be disruptive and it's going to take time. And that's why I think the concerning bit is the debt. It is very big, but the government is trying to do everything. And I think, again, the, the kind of stuff you see in the stock market, these are policy missteps because the government just doesn't know it needs to let go to move to a more market And economy. when it comes to a, an economy having debt, China can cope. Yes, it, it can. It's not like Better than most Greece of it, yeah. where it yeah, has no money in the bank. Absolutely. You know, China has a lot of money. So in yes, the bank. it's slowing, but it's not anywhere close to collapsing. <clears throat> so. My turn. Go on then. <laughs> <laughs> right. Someone said to me that uh, people think that the Indian and Chinese economies are going to save the world. And that's not going to happen, they said. What do you think? Uh, of both those issues. I mean, yeah. yeah. So India is doing very well. In, the Indian economy is actually growing very quickly. But can it save the world from a correction or indeed crash? Um, I think it helps a little bit, but no, I mean, you kind of, if, if the US is going down and Europe's going down, I don't think China and India Nothing. alone can save it. But I, I do think it provides, definitely it provides kind of demand impetus in the world, otherwise it wouldn't be there. Right, okay. The Iran deal was fully implemented on Saturday. A few hours, minutes later, the sanctions were lifted. And uh, so, let me just read you the first paragraph, take my glasses off for the Financial Times. Iran stormed back into the global oil market yesterday, ordering an immediate sharp increase in production and prompting warnings from fellow OPEC members that it risks prolonging the biggest price crash in a decade. Go for it. Great, great kind of, you know, summary and all yeah. of that. Look, 
it's going to be harder. I mean, we spoke about this yesterday. It needs Western expertise. The, there's been decades of uh, sanctions, so it's not going to be, it's not a switch. It's not an overnight switch that it just switches on and all production comes back. We think in the near term, anywhere between 250 to 400,000 barrels per day is possible because yes, the Chinese and the Russians have been involved in the upstream, but some of these fields have never even come online because mm. the expertise is just not there. So because the dollar sanctions are still in place, it's going to be slow to get back to the market. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. It is very positive for the Iranian economy and, and everything else. But it, this whole rhetoric around it's going to be a million barrels per day overnight, no. In, in terms of Western expertise, um, the impression we've been getting is Western companies are just desperate to get in. They really want to sure. be in there, make the money, get the contracts. Is that the case or not? I'd say, I mean, yes, like the likes of Total and ENI who have a long history of working in Iran. Yes, they're keen to go in there. Uh, but again, the buyback contracts, Iran is being questioned that, look, you need to give us the terms and conditions that are at least equivalent to Iraq, which Iran isn't doing so far. And remember, oil at $30, no company is making money. So everybody's being a bit cautious. What's the price today? 28 dollars Okay, so how much does it cost to extract it and then send it to wherever it's going? compared to the price that you're getting per barrel. Do we know how much it costs in to Iran, extract one barrel? Yeah. Uh, it'll, it's a pure extraction costs are probably going to be less than $15. And so, then the, including transportation? No, so then, of course, because... So they're hardly making anything that's, per barrel. That's it. I mean, no, no, overall, I think they'd still make maybe, I don't know, like $10? $10. Yeah, that's amazing. better than Canada, where they're losing money. Sure. Per oh, barrel. Depends where you are. Incredible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And in the North Sea as well. Let's talk about the Tata Steel story. Uh, it was... It was widely expected mm -hmm. that they would announce uh, more than a thousand jobs going. They did. Um, and they're now saying, well, reports are saying further redundancies yeah. are to come. This is a really tricky situation, isn't it? Not least for the UK economy or that part of South mm -hmm. Wales that's been reliant on steel yes. for generations. But also, I mean, we have a piece from Steve Evans, who's in um, China, looking at the full and the impact for China as well. Oh, absolutely. And I think this is where the Chinese slowdown becomes important because I personally think the reason why there's so much focus is not necessarily because China is slowing, but the other economies around the world have been built to supply a manufacturing China. Germany, UK steel, Australia. Not all of that. This is where the problem is because China is rebalancing the other economies also need to do that. And I think you, this is just the start of it. You're going to see a lot more of this in the heavy industries, iron ore, steel, coal. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it is extremely unfortunate for local communities because, as you say, they've been built just around this industry. Four days of Davos at the World Economic Forum are going to concentrate on mainly eight issues, which The Guardian has summarized on uh, this page here that we've chosen. Which ones do you think are the most pertinent, relevant, important? I would say migration. It's got to be migration at the, at the top of that agenda because it's such an important topic. Also because Europe is doing its part and I guess there'll be questions about why the Middle Eastern countries aren't and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but of course, I mean, climate change, because we've had the big uh, deal in Paris and, and, and maybe, but yeah, I mean, I personally would think terrorism and migration would be the top of that agenda. It's interesting, actually. Leonardo DiCaprio looks like he's going to be there. He'll be pushing for action to protect ecosystems, yeah. wildlife. Um, I've been a few times. It's interesting how the Hollywood stars always tend to show up, the likes of Bono as well. It's a very George Clooney did that indeed. as well. Indeed. Yeah. Bill Clinton's always yeah. there. Um, but I think the cybercrime is going to be an interesting one because it is a very hot topic at the moment and, and the restrictions around it. So, yeah. yeah, I hope something comes out of it. Gulf News is looking at this story about David Cameron's idea that uh, Muslim women should learn the English language. In the report that we're playing by Lucy Manning, there's a lady there, a Muslim lady, who says, my mum has lived in this country for 45 years. She doesn't speak a word of English. So it's undoubtedly true. I tell you, I've seen it for myself. Yeah. But people are angry about this. Yeah. yeah. Well, OK, this is the thing. I am all for integration into society, but I, I go to places in, in, in London, very Indian communities, they don't speak a word of That's English. It. And I mean, I'll go there and buy local groceries, but they are not being scrutinized and saying that they need to be learning English ah, to integrate, right? So there is clearly, uh, again, I get the whole integration point, but there is a bias there of some sort, because clearly this is very much about Muslim women not anybody who can't speak English needs to be learned. But overall, you've got to speak the language of the country that you live in. Oh, no, surely, 100%. Right? No, no, that's what I'm saying. I'm all for that, but I'm just saying 
do it as more of a blanket, everybody needs to learn it, because it is to do with integration into society. Yeah, and actually even more controversially, uh, in the Daily Telegraph, which is our last <clears throat> newspaper, we're yeah. not actually looking at the story I'm about to mention to you. It says that Cameron will back Muslim veil. a ban on the Muslim veil which France has done, yes. mm. again, people are upset. Again, and this is where it comes down to, uh, yes, it, if you're in a court and the face needs to be seen, all for it. But if you're saying, oh, you shouldn't be imposing X, Y, Z on a woman, but again, we're doing the same thing by saying you can't not wear the veil if you choose to wear the veil as well. It's very, very controversial. OK, le let me lead into the last story, if you don't mind, Sandy, yeah, by being politically it. incorrect, right? <laughs> My brother-in-law went to Harrods. He was a young, young teenager. He sat down on what he thought was a chair. It was a woman in a full burqa. She freaked out because this boy had sat there. He, was, he stood up. He didn't yeah. know. Yeah. You know, he was yeah. a young kid. Yeah. Nowadays, he'd probably know. Yeah, he would. OK, so IVF. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It From was the full burqa to a know. test tube, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, IVF, a new sort of IVF, where they will uh, fertilize the baby inside the womb by inserting a pill. It's quite revolutionary. Yeah, it is. I guess it's a great step in terms of technology and medicine. And I guess what they're saying is it helps in the bonding between the mother and the child. it's a great child. step for parents, yeah. yeah. Both mum and the dad. Actually. Because otherwise it's yeah. kind of separate and you just yeah. don't feel the same connection. So, yeah, I think that's great. Amrita, thank you very much pleasure. indeed. Always a great pleasure. Still a few days of the week to go, so enjoy yeah, them. Thank Take care. You. Thanks Have a lot. good day too. See you soon. Bye-bye.